All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Trano, Executive Director of Unite America, welcoming you all to our uh, June call for our founding members uh, coming at you from Denver. And we're really excited tonight uh, because we are joined by a very special guest, um, uh, Lillian Mason, uh, who's a Assistant Professor of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland College Park. We're gonna be diving into and exploring uh, what's fueling political polarization in our country and how do we understand it? Uh, so we're going to get there in a few minutes, but first want to start off by giving an opportunity uh, for anyone on the call who's a new, relatively new founding member or hasn't been on one of these calls before uh, to introduce themselves and maybe share a minute on why they got uh, involved. Uh, any takers or volunteers? Maybe Bill from Arizona, I'm not sure uh, we're acquainted yet. Okay, maybe Bill went away. Um, uh, no, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I couldn't get back to the unmute button. <laughs> no, no worries. I'm a elected uh, town councilman in Clarkdale, Arizona, small town in the uh, middle of the state. And um, just went through the uh, Arizona uh, Civic Leadership Academy, Flynn Brown, I'm a Flynn Brown Fellow, and was one of the themes that I tried to talk about a lot in, in that experience. It seems like every issue that we keep re dealing with in the Arizona Town Hall events and, and such all come back to needing to change who's at our legislature. And, <clears throat> and that never happens. And... So that's what we have to do. And, and so I think to, to get to the root of change, at least in Arizona, and I think across the country, it's about who we get elected. And so this is what this is the solution. And I think you, United America has uh, the, the best explanation for how to achieve that. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, being part of this uh, movement, Bill. Um, each and every week we're joined. I met uh, dozens of more people around the country uh, who are giving their time and giving their resources to help make this possible. Uh, founding members are on the call from all people who make monthly uh, recurring contributions or whatever they can to help grow the movement and uh, encourage others who are watching the recording to do so. Uh, you're in america.org slash membership to sign up. Uh, so I'm going to give a few uh, sort of updates on where we're at nationally and then we'll uh, get to a um, there we go. Uh, okay, that should work. Testing one, two, three. Uh, so in the last uh, two weeks, a couple uh, big breakthroughs for folks who care about uh, reforming politics and introducing some new competition. First was in the California uh, top two primary election, a gentleman named Steve Poisner, who's running statewide for insurance commissioner, uh, finished first in his election, um, defeating two other, two Democrats who were in the race. And so Steve, should he win in November now, he moved on to the general election, uh, will be the first ever statewide elected independent in California, uh, which is a big deal. So uh, I think that is a boost of momentum for what we're working on, as was last week in Maine, uh, in their primary, there was a measure on the ballot to uphold the first ever system of ranked choice voting uh, statewide, which is actually used in that primary as well. And for those who aren't familiar, ranked choice voting is a means of ranking the candidates on your ballot according to preference rather than just picking one. Uh, guarantees through a series of uh, runoffs, instant runoffs, that whomever is elected is elected with a majority of support. And it also gives an assurance to voters that they can vote for their most preferred candidate without having to worry about wasting their vote or spoiling the election. Um, so we're really excited to see that uh, measure be upheld. It was originally passed in 2016, but both parties in the legislature tried to repeal it. Uh, this measure prevented that from happening. And so it'll be used again for uh, their federal elections um, this November including in the race in the first congressional district where there's a state representative who's an independent named Marty Grumman running for Congress. So we're keeping a close eye um, on that. So both Steve's success and the success of ranked choice voting, I think, uh, demonstrate there's an appetite out there for doing something new uh, and for 
uh, in Steve's case, leadership that is not tethered to either uh, political party. And that's what, of course, United America is all about, trying to build the infrastructure uh, to allow people to run for office who uh, don't have a party and who want to serve all of the people in their states or districts. Um, one other important update I want to share with you first, those who are on the call tonight, we're going to be announcing this uh, tomorrow uh, publicly to all of our supporters, which is that we are hosting the first ever Unite Summit uh, this August 17th through 19th here in Denver, Colorado, sort of home base for Unite America and also sort of the epicenter of where our uh, independent candidate movement is this cycle. Uh, we're inviting all independent candidates, all independent elected officials, all the grassroots and chapter leaders of our movement, as well as our key stakeholders, our board, our advisors, our donors, to come together uh, for an intense and fun uh, 36 hours to meet each other, to learn from each other, and to strategize on how our movement can scale um, in the years ahead, as well as do everything that we can to achieve some success uh, this November. So unitesummit.us is the website. You can go there now, you can get your ticket. Uh, founding members uh, have a discounted rate. Uh, we're also offering some uh, travel stipends for those who need it, which you can find on the website. So I wanted to share that with you first and hope that you all might be interested in joining us uh, in Denver in August to make some history. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Professor Mason. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I know it's a little late there on the East Coast for joining us. Uh, we first stumbled upon you and your research when I wrote a paper called Ideology Without Issues, The Polarization Consequences of Ideological Identities. Uh, and you also have a new book out called Uncivil Agreement, uh, which we encourage people to check out as well. Um, so first, Professor Mason, I'd be curious just to get some of your background and what led you to this area of study of political uh, polarization. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Um, so I'm mostly, I, I started off uh, being trained in graduate school in political psychology, which is a, a very small subfield of political science that combines sort of an interdisciplinary look at social psychology and political behavior uh, in American politics. Um, and this is a project I've been working on for 10 years. Uh, it started off as my dissertation when I was in graduate school and it's only sort of finally come out now. Uh, but sort of along the way I've been, I've been publishing little things here and there, which is that this article that you spoke about is one of them. Uh, and essentially the idea is that, um, you know, there was this argument going on between uh, political scientists about whether or not Americans, you know, were polarized. And, and they basically define that by saying, it, you know, they're polarized if they disagree about what to do, what the government should do. And effectively what I, what I said was, well, what if they agree with each other on most, you know, on a lot of legislation, but, uh, but we still hate each other anyway. So how can we explain that? So that was the beginning of the project. And I really sort of, I, I used a lot of literature from social psychology to try to figure out what it is that makes groups of people hate each other that I can use to explain um, partisan, partisan intolerance. Got it. And so um, you, you do, you're a, lot, a lot of your work is focused on uh, these differences that we have with each other. We use labels to describe that often. Some are partisan labels like Democrat, Republican. Some are ideological labels like conservative, liberal. Uh, at a high level, how do we understand the difference an identity between partisanship and ideology? So there are different things. Um, and part of the problem with our current state of polarization is that our, um, essentially Demo Democrats and Republicans have become what we say is ideologically sorted. So um, Democrats are, are identifying more as liberal and Republicans are identifying more as conservative. Um, but that's not always the case. And also we tend to see that people's, people's issue positions and preferences don't actually match up with what they call themselves ideologically. Um, so we have, we have plenty of people who, who identify strongly as conservatives, but hold a bunch of liberal policy positions and then vice versa. So, so, you know, and the other thing is that you can identify very strongly as a liberal or a conservative um, and as a Democrat or Republican and have that be relatively unconnected to your policy preferences. Uh, unless your party takes a really strong position and tells you sort of what to believe, in which case partisans tend to go right along with what the party says. And so how do people form these identities and what influences that if it's not issues, if, or at least it's not coherently a set of issues? 
Yeah, so some of the earliest work in the study of, of politi American political behavior essentially says that partisanship is something that's, uh, the quote is, learned at your mother's knee. It's like a, any kind of social identity like religion or, um, or racial identity. It's one of those things that comes with sort of with your family. Um, you are raised into it and you tend to feel really connected to that group of people um, for the rest of your life until you have, you know, unless you have some sort of conversion experience really is very similar to this kind of religious language. Um, and, and the, the social part of it is really what gets us, uh, psychologically engaged. It's what gets us angry. It's what gets us excited. Um, and, and this idea that we're connected to all these other people that are in the same group as us, that's really where we can kind of better understand the, the thought processes of partisans. And so what, have you studied that is changing um, when we're seeing this great antipathy towards the other side that we didn't really experience to this extent, you know, 10 or 20 years ago? What's so, fueling that kind of negativity about liberals on Demo uh, conservatives or Democrats on Republicans? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so partisanship has always been a strong social identity, um, but that doesn't explain why things are getting worse. One of the things that, that I think explains why things are getting worse is that what we've been seeing is actually um, this increasing alignment between party identity and other social identities like race and religion uh, and ideological identity. Uh, so, so in 1972, Democrats and Republicans were um, is somewhat racially distinct, somewhat religiously distinct, um, but to the extent, to the extent that they were distinct, it was relatively minor differences between the parties. Uh, and what we're seeing today is actually just a huge divide and a huge increase in the social differences between the parties. Um, so, so essentially, you know, Republicans right now are, are over 90% white, um, generally evangelical, majority evangelical or more than majority evangelical. Democrats are, you know, 50% white, 20% Hispanic, 20% black, um, and religiously very mixed, largely secular, um, but also Christian, because Christians are the make up a majority of the country. Um, and so we actually have these two parties that, that are becoming um, sort of so socially distinct from one another that they don't have a lot of what we call cross-cutting identities, things that can help you understand the people on the other side, because, you know, maybe your neighbor is in a different party than you, but you, went, you go to church together, right? Something that allows you to see each other as human beings. Those types of cross-cutting identities are disappearing and we're becoming much more isolated socially and culturally as partisans. So in essence, the difference in yesteryears of ideology being we believe differently has now become synonymous with we are different. We have different backgrounds. We live in different places. Our families are different. Our other identities are different. So it becomes harder to transcend the policy differences as a result, if I'm understanding that right. Yeah, exactly. And, and in fact, we are less inclined to want to transcend policy differences because the, the most important thing when you have such a, when, you're, when your partisan identity is, it also encompasses these, these racial and, and religious and other social identities, what ends up happening is that every time there's a conflict, which is basically an election, right? Anytime there's a chance for your party to win or lose, you kind of feel like your racial and religious group is also winning and, or losing along with the party. And that makes it a lot more consequential and it also makes it a lot harder to want to compromise when what you're compromising is such a, such a large portion of your self identity and who you think you are. And what, what, what does psychology uh, and human nature tell us about um, the significance that group identities play in the kind of tribalism that we're seeing today? So this is a really, really deeply seated thing. And it's it, all humans have it. All humans are going to do it. We couldn't have society if we didn't have, you know, these inclinations to form social groups and to, and also to exclude other people from our groups. I mean, we, we as humans have basic needs for inclusion and exclusion. We need to feel like we're part of a group and we need to feel like not everybody gets to be part of that group. And, and those needs are, are, you know, very deep. And to the extent that, you know, we've, uh, there are there are so, social psychological studies that have demonstrated that when you just tell people um, that they're in these random group, you give them group names that are random, basically random um, and value free, and you tell them, hey, this is you know this is your group. Now I want you to try allocating money to a bunch of people. Um, and the the great example, the sort of the example that I give of this is, you know, you can either choose that everybody gets five dollars, or you can choose that this group that you're in uh, gets four dollars. 
but the other group that you're not in gets three. And so it's this test of whether you would be okay with the greater good um, or whether you're willing to sort of sacrifice money in order to have that victory. And most people in these experiments, and they've been repeated hundreds of times, most people tend to choose the victory condition. So, so there is a, there's almost like a financial benefit that you can, you can measure that people feel associated with their group's victory. And what in your research um, have you surfaced that predicts uh, the extent of which people in one group have negative attitudes towards the other? Uh, so I've actually looked at, um, I look at what's, what's, what's been called social distance measures, um, which is actually something that started being measured in the 1920s uh, in order to assess uh, racial and ethnic um, intolerance. And I, you know, early on when I was trying to figure, you know, work on this project, I decided, well, I wonder what would happen if we apply this to parties. Uh, not actually expecting that we would find a whole lot of people who are willing to say, you know, that they're socially distant from outgroup partisans. But in fact, I found substantial numbers of people who were unwilling to live next door to an outgroup partisan, unwilling to be friends with an outgroup partisan. Um, the big one is unwilling to marry. Uh, would you be willing to marry or, or see your child marry uh, a member of the outgroup party? And, uh, and people really do tend to say that they don't they, they prefer it if outgroup partisans are not in their neighborhoods. They prefer it if they're not, if they're not socializing with them, even on a, on a sort of acquaintance level basis. And are those social distances more profound now than other kinds of social distances outside of political affiliation? Yes. So the one that has been measured over time is, the, is the, uh, agreeing that your child should be able to marry somebody outside of the party. And that has increased substantially uh, since the 1960s. Um, it's also it's also more of a divide now, according to uh, research from some other political scientists who studied this. Um, it's a bigger divide than actually racial divides in terms of you know approving of your child marrying someone outside the racial group. That's actually uh, less polarized currently than approving of your child marrying outside of the partisan group. Um, you mentioned something in your paper. You said um, team names without issue knowledge can generate political conflict that is unmoored from distinct policy goals in this kind of environment? I mean, like we're fighting with each other for the sake of fighting with each other, not necessarily to achieve a policy victory. Can you expand on that and just explain, sort of what is the significance to our system of government as a result of what's driving the polarization? Yeah, it's really dangerous. Um, and and it, essentially what it means is that we can uh, be told by our party that this is the position that we're holding as a party and find our way around to justifying that position, um, really regardless of our basic values or, or you know, preferences, or even personal interest, which is supposed to be the one guiding force of our, you know, of our, of our vote choice. Um, and, and really, the, it, what the research has shown is that you can change a person's mind about a policy position very, very quickly, simply by telling them that their party um, supports of certain position. And then when you ask them about their position and say, you know, for instance, did your party have any effect on your, on your attitude? They'll say, absolutely not. And then this is actually the most, the most crazy thing. They'll, you can say, well, I want you to write the, um, a letter to the editor for your local paper. Uh, and your, and your representative is probably going to read it. So you might actually change policy. I want you to explain this position. Uh, and people will write reasons for, for a position that they have just been essentially experimentally given, um, believing that this is their real position and believing that this is what, what they, what they you know, fully, fully would have believed in even outside of the laboratory. It's scary stuff, uh, but also explains the last couple of years in American politics quite well through that, through that lens. Um, obviously, an issue that's happening right now is this family separation at the, at the southern border. And I noticed a poll from Quinnipiac that showed overall Americans 66 to 27 disapproved of this policy. And when you look across race, uh, uh, geography, age, gender, everyone disapproves, except if you ask by party. Re Republicans approve of it, you know, 55, 35, something that I think most reasonable people would say, maybe that's not consistent with who we are as a country or our values. Could what you're describing explain how this can possibly be the case? Absolutely. 55% yeah. of a party to believe something like that. And I'm sure there may be examples on the other side as well. 
I would actually argue that, um, that if you would ask those same people a year ago about whether or not this is a humane policy, that they probably would have said no. Um, because the, what, what ends up happening to people psychologically is that once the party has taken a stance on an issue, particularly if it's a, uh, if it's a controversial stance, there is this need to defend the group, to, um, to, to find a way to justify the position and to essentially stand up for the party um, in a way that, you know, that really is, is self-protective psychologically. It's, it's, you know, when you feel that your party is so central to your sense of who you are, admitting that they're wrong or admitting that they're doing something, you know, morally wrong um, can be really painful and can be really um, threatening to an individual's sense of self and self-esteem, et cetera. So, so it's absolutely, you know, I would not be surprised if we had, you know, if we had had some sort of time machine and gone back a year ago and asked people the exact same question before the parties took a stance on it, um, that we probably would have seen very different answers. Right. Um, so I want to ask a couple last questions before opening up to our members uh, who are on the line, uh, which is, you know, what can we do about this? And I'm particularly interested in your take on what role do you think uh, independent leaders, those who don't have labels, can play in trying to build bridges and find some common ground between both sides? Yeah, so independent leaders are in a really unique place um, because there is not really, um, right, Democrats and Republicans are, are so strongly identified because, uh, partially because they're in opposition to each other. Um, and so independents are in this sort of, in this sort of middle ground space. Um, the, the difference, I think, or the, the, the contribution that independents, I think, could make 